he's the most powerful guy in the world, and you say he's got a lot on his plate. That's the job, dog. That's the job. This is Faith Complex. Hosted by Professor Jacques Berliner Plau of Georgetown University. Hello, my name is Jacques Berliner Plau of Georgetown University, and you're watching Faith Complex. Joining us today is Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, my fellow Hoya and University Professor of Sociology. We're so happy he's a member of our team now. Professor Dyson, welcome. Professor Berliner Blau, it's always great to be here with you. All right, January 20th, 2009, Barack Hussein Obama is mm. inaugurated, obviously a very historical day for, for America. On Inauguration Day, was there a lingering pessimism underneath all the joy? About uh, his presidency? About his presidency, or, yeah. or maybe the interaction between his presidency and the United States as it is constantly. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't know if it was pessimism, but it was definitely a note, a, a kind of blue note mm. that hung above the crowd, a so to speak. A minor third. It's a minor third, brother. Yeah. And those minor thirds, uh, you know, trading fives as uh, Louis Armstrong, right? Think that there is a, a real sense that, yes, there's tremendous hope and possibility, but there's also the reality inspector of race. And no matter how much Barack Obama has sought to avoid it, how much he has sought to dismiss it, how much he's sought to rise above it, uh, there are the forces pulling him back down to racism. And there's also the fact that uh, he's disinclined uh, with his genial character to address it in the first place. So that's a bad convergence. The reality of racism that wants to blacken him in the, all the negative fashion, and on the other hand, his disinclination to embrace the reality of his blackness in the positive sense that might help America negotiate its way or navigate its way through some of these landmines. I think he needs to do a better job of helping America gr grapple with this. But all the posters around him, all the white guys around him, mm -hmm. don't touch that with a 10-foot pole. Leave that alone, man. And then on the other side, we've got all these people jumping on him because he's, because he's a black man, and he can't even acknowledge that the former president of the United States of America, Jimmy Carter, nearly celebrating his 85th birthday, said, look, I'm a Southerner, I'm a white Southerner. Mm. I know what the deal is. Barack Obama can't even afford to acknowledge the legitimacy of what Mr. Carter said for fear that he will look like he's crying in his beer and playing the victim. Do we cut him some slack because he's got a, an economy <clears throat> which is completely combusting. He's Absolutely. got these two wars going on and probably others that we don't even know about. Right. He's got the health care. Maybe it's a kind of Machiavellian move or the sign of a mature politician. Well, tell me what you think. That no, that's he, a great... That he doesn't want to bring this up right now. Of course he doesn't. But here's the thing. It's not that, you, you know, I'd rather control it. If you're going to be really Machiavellian, keep your enemies close, <laughs> right? Keep your friends close and enemies closer. If we can mix in some Sun Tzu and some Machiavellian uh, insight there. Here's the thing. It's not going away. You know, you're talking about health care. It's about race. Mm. You know, disproportionate numbers of black and Latino people. It's not, you don't have to introduce it. It's there, mm. and people see it. Seize the authority to articulate the uplifting and helpful meanings of race, tell the truth about race, and then move forward. So all the stuff you're talking about, he's got economy, war, and all that stuff, that stuff has racial implications. Let's be honest about it. The American people get it. They're nervous about what you think about it. I mean, you lie. Mm. You know, what's that about? That's did you about hear the same overtone that folks like Maureen, da did you hear you lie? Boy, of yes. you heard that. Uh, the yeah. first time you heard it, you heard it. Oh, absolutely. I heard worse than, oh, you boy, I heard the N-word as well. But, you know, my point is because you're dealing with a Southern climate. This man whose grandfather was deep into the Confederate, he still celebrates the Confederacy. You can tell me it's about heritage all you want, and I accept that, but it's not only about heritage. It's about a heritage that dissented from America to the point it wanted to secede from the nation. So I think that we have to be very insistent that, yeah, we got to deal with these deeply and profoundly racial currents that, that go underneath. And I don't blame Obama. He's in a tough position. We're not living in a post-racial era. And Mr. Obama himself recognized that. People think, now that we got one black president, race is done. Really? Hmm. So had Hillary Clinton been elected, no more need for an ERA. No more need to talk about women making 70 cents on dollars what a man makes. Mm -hmm. Really? So that structural inequality can be eradicated by the election of one person. We know that's ludicrous to begin with, as Mike Tyson might say. All right, let's, <clears throat> let's try it this way. David Brooks, who I consider to be a respectable and sober voice, yes. uh, writing for the New York Times, goes jogging mm -hmm. on September 12th. You mm -hmm. know the piece very well. And it comes across 3.5 trillion uh, Glenn Beck followers. And mm -hmm. he comes to the conclusion race is not the dominant factor here. Mm -hmm. uh, the analysis struck me as a little bit odd. Mm -hmm. When you see the birther movement, when you see the folks coming out for Glenn Beck, mm -hmm. uh, when you see the town hall protesters, mm -hmm. and as far as I can tell, they're overwhelmingly white. Yeah. What are you seeing there? 
Well, I'm, I'm saying the rearticulation of racial animus, of panic, white panic, uh, being politically covered. Uh, you know, what does left versus right have to do with monkey? What does left versus right have to do with calling Michelle Obama a member of the Pygmies? What does left versus right have to do with characterizing Obama as a witch doctor? Tell me where ideology plays that, except if you want to exclusively quarantine a kind of racial hostility and animus to the right, which I would never do. There's enlightened liberal racism and there is vicious right-wing racism. The point is that the birther movement calling into question this man's citizenship, this is saying to black people, you really don't belong. I mean, they are against him because he's progressive. They are against him because he's liberal. They are against him because they think he's the second coming of Marx, all of which is ludicrous, but I get that. That doesn't necessarily have to do anything with race. But there's also race. So when I hear the birthers movement, I hear them claiming he's not America, and I hear the health care stuff, and I see these people on the mall with all these vicious things, you're, you're, it's pure and simple racial animus that's been gussied up, that's been dressed up, that's been adorned with the new raiments of 21st century racism. All right, let's go to religion. All right, let's mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit. Can you think of any tangible way in which religious ideas are influencing the work of the Obama administration? Well, uh, look, I think the fact that he wants to do the health care reform is his belief that all people should be able to exist and subsist in a way that uh, they're not hurting, that, you know, that those who have ought to help those who don't have. You know Barack Obama. I do. Something I've always thought about, Barack, when, I, when I look mm. at him, I've always said, he is inscrutable. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, a lot of great qualities there, yeah, but a, I don't know who the real inner Barack Obama is. So without giving away anything, <laughs> tell us about Barack Obama as a Christian, as a Christian man. What are the ideas that yeah. influence him? What's his theology like to the degree that you can? Yeah, well, that inscrutability doesn't stop at the, you, you, at you. It stops at even people who probably know him and know him much far better than I do. I think in terms of his theology, look, he was part of Trinity United Church of Christ. Mm -hmm. I know it's not, we're not supposed to say that. Oh, my God, Jeremiah Wright. Uh, but if you love Barack Obama, you love Jeremiah Wright at a certain level. I know you hate to love him, but you got to love him too. Because this is the man who brought this man, Barack Obama, who's now our president, to God. He's the one who introduced him to his God. He married him. He baptized his children. He heard in uh, Jeremiah Wright's church ideas of love, of justice, of concern for the poor, of concern for those who are the least of these, of forging racial connections beyond black communities, of seeking ways to... Uh, leverage the authority morally and religiously of black America when dealing with other, um, you know, social and political issues. So that's what Barack Obama learned.